Hi, and welcome to the Creating Living and Making Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Adam Mackey, and as always, I'm joined this week by Grant Alexander. Hello. And Morley Kurt. Hello. So, this week's a little bit different. Um, we actually had a bit of issue trying to find a time to record, so you may notice that um, we're all a bit different this week. Um it's like the energy level literally just, just turned, turned on their heads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I literally just had two hours sleep. It's now 10 p.m. for me. Normally record at 11 a.m. for me. Um, and then it's 8 a.m. for the boys. <laughs> yes. And so, you're also um, going to be working the night shift. Yeah, so I after we finish recording this, I'll be then going back to bed for three hours and getting back up and going back to work. So that's fun. Wow. So if well, you're wondering why, let's why my voice is let's extremely deep, I literally woke let's up go, 10 go. minutes ago. Everyone do 10 burpees. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Adam, oh, do 10 burpees. Really. Not everyone. Adam Morley, <laughs> you guys are like into working out and stuff. I, if I could burp on cue. No, Not I meant burp. Like, <laughs> like push up, jump in the air. I literally, I literally cannot do that. They're hard. That's an that's um, intense workout. It's, it's definitely one of my goals. Like I used to be able to almost do it, but. I can't, I can't push myself up high enough to get my feet underneath. Mm. But yeah, soon. Yeah. So, um, what's in your clamps this week, Grant? Oh well, starting with me, eh? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the guy who was furiously <laughs> typing as we were starting. <laughs> so the guy who said, "I'll come up with it on the fly." Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's what you get. <laughs> Well, so uh, it's my uh, wedding anniversary this week, and I need to make a gift uh, still. Um, I have an idea of one, but uh, I don't know. I haven't I haven't finalized it. I think it's going to I'm going to make a, a pendant that matches some earrings that I made earlier this year um, and then it, like make a necklace, basically. Um and then maybe some other stuff to go along with that. But I always like to try and make something um, because that's what I do. Uh, the other thing is I released the beard video um, and the support from the community has been like really uh, heartwarming. Um, so I'm if you missed the last episode or this is the first one, I guess I'll explain. I'm shaving my beard off and... Uh, yeah, I, I did a video that was the intro of all my videos from the past year and like seven months. And I've been growing my beard for a year and eight months. So I basically started my YouTube channel uh, shortly after I started growing my beard. So it kind of shows the progression of it from almost clean face to whatever you can call it now. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. At the end of September, I'm going to be shaving it all off. Sweet, cool. Yeah, it was um, that was an interesting video. I, I forgot how short your beard was, I, because I've seen all your videos and I didn't, I, I didn't even realize like doing this every week, just staring at that beard every week. You forget how short you used to have it. Yeah, even wow, me. Just, it's crazy. I just skipped to the beginning. I didn't even. It is short. I don't think I've ever yeah. seen it that short. That's crazy. Yeah, don't yep. don't don't go and watch the original videos. Like some of the one of them, I even don't even have <laughs> up on YouTube anymore because I didn't like it like so much that I took it off YouTube. But I still have the video, so I I grabbed the the intro to it. But uh, it's yeah. funny, like when don't, it's really don't watch short, the early ones. When it's really short, you look very different. But like when it yeah. reaches a certain length, it's just like this. Now it's like your face is the same, <laughs> but then there's more beard attached to it. <laughs> I think video three in that on that video is definitely a good length for you. Looks good. Yeah. Yeah. I I think for a while it's just gonna be more well, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna shave it off and then I'm gonna be lazy and not not shave again for until That's me. A yeah. year and eight months. Well, yeah. maybe not that long. Because <laughs> it actually so at at a certain point it becomes more work. Like your beard like it starts out like your shit you're like shaving is work so then you stop shaving and then you're like great i have no work to do on my face i just wake up and go but then at a certain point you get bed beard um <laughs> so you you have to it's like having long hair you have to have a shower in the morning or else it 
Like it's all stuck up in weird angles. So, and then when you get out of the shower, you got to comb it out. And it's like, this is as much work as shaving. <laughs> like I, I've been wanting to shave it for a while, really, but uh, uh, I knew this thing was coming up, so I waited. Basically, are you gonna are you gonna do one of those videos like with your son where you do like before and after, but he doesn't see you shave? <laughs> I've thought about it. He's uh, so obviously he's seen me with clean shaven before, so I hope he'll recognize it me. But he won't. No. Well, how old is he yeah. now? He's two and a half. Two and a half. Yeah, I mean that one. That's a big one year. I don't know how much you. I guess. Years ago. We'll see. Maybe I'll we'll see. maybe I'll do that and see what he says. You know, I'll put I'll, I'll grab the camera and if it's a good reaction, I'll throw it up on my Instagram. Yeah, and, and if he cries, it. you can still throw it up on his your Instagram and then embarrass him <laughs> in years to come. Boy, yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> nice, very nice. Hmm. Well, what about uh, you, Molly? This week, I am the I am the reason for our weird recording time and ruining everyone's day. <laughs> um, or me personally too. I was gonna be home to like two p.m. every day. Fair, but uh, I am not in Toronto this week. I'm in Cape Cod in the states for my sister's wedding. So she's getting married on Friday, and uh, we booked a trip for the monday before to the monday after so we arrived a couple days ago today is wednesday it's been great i haven't seen my family in like uh nine months basically since like christmas and new year's of last year so it's really nice to see everyone and uh it's very pretty here it's like very quiet beach town uh it's a good change of pace from the city um so yeah it's been great kind of spent all day yesterday at the beach and Lots of eating and hanging out. Um, yeah, it's really it's really nice. I, change I had, pace in normal life. What was that? Change of pace in normal life. Yeah, for sure. Um, I had the we I finished my work up on the Top Chef install right before leaving. Um, the install still has a bit more work to do, but we got like the whole set sort of built with all the windows and everything up. Um. So I don't know if I'll, I should see it in its completed state uh, when we go do the teardown after they film the season. Cause I think the filming only takes like five or six weeks and then they really? tear it down wow. and put it back into storage. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is kind of wild, I guess. I guess the contestants go on and I don't know, seasons, that kind of makes sense. Seasons like nine episodes or whatever. Yeah. Film it all. Everyone doesn't have to put their life on hold for a year. <laughs> I'm so interested in all that kind of stuff, like because we got shows like that here, and and same thing. You think how do these these people take so much time off work? Yeah, I, they just crazy. front end load it. So it's yeah. basically like one episode per day, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So that's why, like at the end of this, like you see them at the end of like the season, and they are uh, you know like the Forge and Fires guys. Some of them just look like ragged, as if they've been working like 24 hour days they have that's basically what they've been doing yeah, it's, just a, yeah. it's just a sprint for like three weeks right it's but it's a yeah, we, we got i think we do top chef here but there's a show that my wife and i watch called my kitchen rules which is very similar and i remember a few years ago they literally recorded two endings so like one of each person winning but the person didn't the people didn't know who had won, like the actual contestants didn't know who had won until they saw which one got aired. Oh, wow. That would be so weird. That's a good way of doing it because it always leaks out who wins. Oh, does it? Yeah. Yeah. Like if you you know the person who won, you know they won. Right. Right? Yeah, they're not going to keep that a a secret from the people. Um, Anyways, but yeah, that was... It was, it was good work. Um, and then also right before leaving, um, I finished up those embossed leather keychains I was working on for uh, the restaurant in my neighborhood, Completo. Um, and the owner was like super happy with them. She's a very nice woman. Um, eventually, we want to do more stuff for like their grand opening, but they actually opened this location kind of as COVID was starting. So they had they had seating in the restaurant for like a few weeks and then they closed for a while and then they reopened for patio seating. So she's like, it's kind of weird because like 
she's trying to figure out if like the moment has passed if like a grand opening at this point would just feel kind of weird um mm. but uh we'll definitely what a, what a stressful situation though wait open a restaurant and then next thing you know yeah you go to close like yeah i, I think they've done pretty well so this was actually their second location and the first uh, one stayed yeah. open for takeout but uh, yeah. i think they've also just been generally surprised with like how much business they've gotten and how supportive people have been it's a it's a I good think, location I think like a lot there's of nothing really have been trying to support local yeah for sure yeah and it's there's not really any restaurants like it in my neighborhood like i live in a chinatown uh which is like at the beginnings of gentrification and kind of changing um so it's like the only really uh south american takeout like south american fast food restaurant around there yeah. uh, and they have like a patio yeah. outside so they do a lot of like um they like like nachos and these like fully loaded sandwiches with like guacamole and beef and um, a lot of like Venezuelan pastries and stuff. Do they have uh, what are they called? Uh, crap, never mind. Okay, <laughs> I think one of their sandwiches <laughs> is called like a churrasco. I don't know if that rings any bells. They do some like fully loaded poutine with guacamole and salsa and stuff. Classic Canada. But yeah, that's been uh, most of my clamp this week. Not a ton of making amidst finishing one thing up and traveling. But Grant, are you just really trying to remember? <laughs> yes. Like Describe when this, it to me. Maybe, maybe I'll be able to spur it. It's like a little pouch that they put uh, filling into. An empanada? No. It's a Venezuelan thing. I, I actually kind of know what you're talking about. Oh, a, um, I know what you're talking about. An arepa. Yes. I yes. don't think they do arepas. But when oh. I was in Montreal, we lived in like a Venezuelan neighborhood and we would get arepas all the time. Yeah, they're so good. Uh, we actually made arepas a few weeks they're ago. So they're they're so can good. We stop, can we stop saying rape? <laughs> no. Arepas. It's I always pronounce it arepa, but uh but yeah. It's a food. You can Google it. Like it's A R E P A. It's basically like for the listeners. It's basically like a um, a bun made of cornmeal, or not even. It's like corn. It's like a corn pre cooked cornmeal, and you get this fluffy little bun that you slice open and you fill with like. The, I think the traditional fillings are like black beans, plantains, feta cheese. Fill them with like meat and fish and other things. They're they're very good. Yeah. Mm. They can, you can also get them as like breakfast versions, which is like really yummy. Ooh, I haven't had that. Yeah. There's a place near my work when I actually used to work downtown and, uh, and they, and we used to go there. The problem was like an, an arepa on its own wasn't filling enough, but two was too much. So <laughs> I didn't, I, I would like sometimes get them and then just go like, oh, I'm still hungry. Then you'd get a second one and go, ah, I'm so full. Mm. First world problems. Yeah, it's totally. Uh, Adam, what's in uh, what's in your clamps this week? Um, well, I made progress on the next woodworking for kids video, so I um, got all the dinosaur shapes cut out. Um, I've glued. So what I did is I got a board and glued on a piece of paper with like a dinosaur, and then the scroll saw cut out the dinosaur, keeping the like doing it in one cut around the outside. And then the, um, I suppose like what you'd, what would be the scrap wood, like not the dinosaur. I've then glued onto a board of MDF. And then I'm going to get Bentley to cut the dinosaur up into like random shapes so that it can then go into the outer cut, the outside cut. It's like the puzzle goes into the. Gotcha. It's like a frame. Yeah. Um, so I've done that just waiting for them to glue up and then I've got to cut them all out. But I didn't think about it at the time that I should have actually like cut up square pieces of wood to cut the dinosaur out of. Cause my original plan was to get a whole separate piece of wood to cut the, the hole for the puzzle pieces to go in. Mm-hmm. And then as I was cutting it out, I was like, well, hang on, this is like a perfect hole for them to then go into. So yeah. Um, so I've done that, and then I tried to do. Last week I was talking about making the car parts for my for my car, um, and that 
did not work at all. Did you end up 3D the, printing them? No, no. So um, remember I was talking about using EVA foam? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. To do it, yeah. The plastic dip. So I... Got, yeah, so so I got the pe- I got all the foam cut up and everything and glued it all together that I needed to do, but then just trying to cut a design into the foam, it's just so sketchy that I just couldn't get it to work properly. Hmm. Um, what were you yeah. using to cut it? I at first I was using a um, like a stair- not a Stanley knife. It's the one where I think Molly had one the other week, where like, like the- you can actually have like a whole thin blade come out. Like the awful knives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of those. And then I tried doing that with heating it up as well, which worked a little bit better. But yeah, just trying to get it actually smooth cut was just really hard. You need a, a hot knife. So like you basically yeah. hook up a piece of wire to two terminals on a battery and it mm. heats that wire up and it slices thing like foam amazingly. Yeah. I think I'm just going to try and find a new material. Yeah, you could do that too, I guess. So we did actually have a topic this week. Um, We wanted to talk about brand loyalty, which Mm. um, was actually going to be quite funny for me because um, if anyone has seen my video on YouTube, I own pretty much every Ryobi tool you can buy. So (laughs) So you seem pretty loyal. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think... um, like when I was thinking about this topic, what I was thinking about is that there's like always these like people who like to argue about why their brand is better than other brands, and uh, and mm-hmm. like to a to a fault to like a like I'll never own a Ford Chevy for life like kind of thing, and you just kind of like like I remember being a kid, and it was like it's the same with like it reminded me of like the hockey team rivalries. But when I really look down, like as I got older, I'd start looking at things a little bit more logically. I go like, what's up with brand loyalty? Why are like what has Chevy done or what has Ryobi done or what has DeWalt done to be better than Milwaukee? Like in reality, like there's some sometimes it's like there's, you know, uh, I know there's some companies out there that have been really uh, supportive of the community. OK, you get some loyalty mm. from that, right? But then there's like people who are like, I only own Festool and Woodpeckers. And it's like, okay, but what, what have they done to you to get like you to buy everything? So that's what I was I, – I don't know. That's what I was thinking about is like talking about like maybe the psychology behind brand loyalty as well as what are you loyal to. I mean mm. my theory about brand loyalty is – a big part of it is it's usually things people have spent a good amount of money on. Like they're relatively high ticket items. So I feel like part of it is like a defense mechanism. So if you're, mm. you've spent like $30,000 on a truck and you're like, okay, now this is the best truck and you have to feel like you fully bought into it and die on the hill of it so that you you're justifying your purchase to yourself or, or with yeah. t- power tools, for example, like if you're buying into a battery system and you're buying all these other uh, tools and even if it's not necessarily the most expensive investment you'll ever make, it is still an investment because by buying those tools and if you want to stay in the same battery system, you're kind of sticking yourself into a lane. So I've always felt it's a way for people to kind of like justify an investment to themselves. Hmm. Um, hmm. But I mean, ob- that being said, like of course certain brands of things are better than others. I mean, I'm not going to start saying that like a. Uh, I don't know, I'm not. I, I don't have an example, but BM, I'm not arguing. BMWs, I'm sure, are great cars, and I I'm, I know that's why you own them, Grant. No, I own them because I get free parts. <laughs> oh, literally, interesting. It's literally the reason I have them is because I I got free parts for a long time for working on the race team. So we would buy cars uh, to to turn into race cars, and when you do that, you take off a lot of the stock parts, and those stock parts go on my car. So that's so cool. So the, yeah. I, like I'll. Obviously, like I like my car, I wouldn't drive it if it was garbage. Well, when I l- compare it to other cars, I don't go like, "Oh, it's leaps and bounds over this other car." Like I think it looks nicer, but that's me. I can totally see someone going, "No, I think the Mercedes looks nicer." Or I even think the Toyota Camry looks nicer. Okay, that's great for you. Yeah. Like, so, do you feel like you've developed any BMW brand loyalty with all the work you've done on them? 
So I, if anything, I've like lost loyalty to them because I look at their cars today and I had a newer one um, and I sold it because I thought like, it's not what, what I want is them to go back to the eighties and make that car again. Mm-hmm. And where they're going with the brand isn't where I want to go. Um, especially in North America, they're still mm-hmm. making smaller one like versions of the cars and, and like lower tech, more peppy versions of the cars in Europe. But in North America, it's buy an SUV or leave us alone is basically right. what they're like thinking of. So if anything, like by, by working on the cars, especially the newer ones, I've, I've lost loyalty in them mm. uh, because I feel like, you know, they're like, like silly things like on the newest cars, you can't check your oil. There's <laughs> no that? dipstick. So you have to bring it to like a certified mechanic for them to do it. No, you just don't get a chance. Like there's a little button that you can press and, and it tells you whether your oil is full or empty gotcha. on your dashboard. But you can't check it to see like, is it black or clear, right? Like it, how old is the oil in your car by looking at it? You can't tell, right? Yeah, it's, it's all just computerized. They just want you yeah. to trust the computer. Right. And I don't trust computers. I, I don't. I trust myself. Um. <laughs> so that's like – anyways, that's like a – it's interesting. So that that question, do I, am I loyal to them? I would say no. I'm on the opposite. I think I'm probably more loyal to like, I don't know, Nissan because they're putting out like a Micra, the the tiniest car, cheapest car on the market. It's that's what I want, right? Like, <laughs> I, I'll never own one because they're too small. But you like what but, they're doing. But I like what they're doing, yeah. and I like they're involved in the community way more than BMW. Like BMW basically uh, tells us to go F ourselves when we ask for sponsorship for a race car. And Nissan, what they do is they sponsor entire series. So it's like this weird mm-hmm. thing. Interesting. Uh, Spe- speaking of cars, so like here in Australia, uh, have you, I'm assuming you guys have heard, V8, have heard of V8 supercars. Mm-hmm. Ra- racing series. Yes. So like for 40 years, me growing up, it was either Ford or Holden. Yeah. Everyone... Went Ford or Holden. The last few years, that that pretty much Ford and Holden aren't even in anymore. It's all just like Camrys and all that crap. And the, the cars that um, don't come with V8s in them. I love it. <laughs> exactly. So I'm just looking at V8 supercars is just kind of like stock car racing. Uh, it's touring car yeah. racing. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's yeah, longer so, so, races. Yeah. The, so touring car racing is more on street circuits. Gotcha. And stock car racing is more ovals. Got it. Yeah, so, so they'll literally close down like, um, what are, what are they? What are, what's it called? Where there's different oh, blocks. So they'll, they'll literally close down blocks in a in a city and create a circuit. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So yeah. So growing up, it was just you know Ford and Holden, and then Ford ended up moving over to America, or whatever, because you know who cares about keeping stuff in Australia, and then Holden followed suit. So now no one really cares. Um, so that like brand loyalty just went straight out of the window. Right. Right. Yeah. But when you talk about like, so to switch gears back to, to, to the more making, talking about like the batteries and getting like trapped in a battery thing, people mm. will argue to the, the death over whether DeWalt or Milwaukee or one of any of the other colors of tools is better than the other one. And the way I always look at it is I go, Buy the one that's on sale; they're all the same. Yeah, mm. at that level. The other thing, uh, exactly. the other thing is like, how legitimate is like the buy, buying into a battery system argument? Like, is it really? Unless you are a contractor who always needs to take your tools from place to place, you need to have the most efficient. You want just the same batteries for everything. Is it really that much work to have multiple tool brands and multiple batteries? So the big thing has to do with space. So the chargers take up space. Yeah, right? but if you have a workshop, mm-hmm. like, and you have multiple outlets, I, I just feel like people who don't need to be so adamant in, in this argument are needlessly adamant in it. They're just yeah. like playing the game. I get. I look. I at feel it, like in America, um, like having more than one battery system, like battery brand, seems to be more popular than over here. Um, hmm. like if, if, like watching YouTube. It is what I mean. So, like, 
you know, generally if I see people that have like different brands of um, battery tools, they're usually in America. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I think, so I think a lot of times what happens in America and the YouTube is that they get brand like gifted from different companies. So now they have different mm. brands. The other thing that's happened for a long time, like I had Milwaukee and I really wanted a trim router. Well, for a long time, Milwaukee didn't make a battery powered trim router. Hmm. And so I was like, well, I don't want to buy a new brand. Like I have so many batteries. I don't want to get another one. Um, hmm. So I just didn't get a trim router and now they have one. But like for a long time that happened. So if you wanted, if you wanted certain battery powered tools, you had to buy them across different brands. But now that's kind of gone yeah. away. Interesting. Okay. But I like so buying into a single battery brand, like the reason it for me it makes sense. Like I have a workshop, but I in my like I don't have a lot of outlets. Mm-hmm. And if anyone's watched my workbench, you can see there's a you know, one of those six like turn two into six things. Yeah. And then it connected mm-hmm. to that is also uh, a nine plug uh you oh, know, geez. power bar. <laughs> <laughs> so like most of the stuff is charging. It's all charging. So it's never on all at the same time, right? Like yeah. mm-hmm. it's all stuff that I just need to have plugged in. So when I plug in my, you know, whatever, my phone or my other thing, like it's all stuff that isn't going to be on at the same time, but yeah, I, it needs to be plugged in. So mm-hmm. that being said, it's also my table saw is plugged in there and my desk collector and everything else. <laughs> but, uh, but you know what, to, when, when not to turn on everything at the same time. So that's all that matters. Right. And my fridge is on the same circuit for some stupid reason. So uh, <laughs> it often goes black in my workshop. Uh, but I'm I'm working on that. Uh, but that's why, like, I don't have an extra outlet to spare. Like, mm. I don't have extra outlets, like, laying around trying, to, you know, just waiting to be filled with more charging stations. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Just think, having I the one also, battery just um, is so much nicer. Fair. Yeah, and especially when when at first when when battery powered tools first came in, you were pretty much stuck. Like you, the battery you had was the tool you had to use. But now you can buy attachments that you can use any brand battery with any brand um, tool. Oh, like really? You can take a Ryobi battery and use it with a Milwaukee tool. And I I don't know if it's like every tool with every tool every battery, but like there are convert like conversion plates and stuff you can buy. Um, but I think, I think here, like say for instance, i you know, I have every, pretty much every, every tool you can think of. Um, there's some I don't have, but anyway, when you buy into, like I did with Ryobi, I, I originally liked the look of Ryobi and, and stuff here in Australia. Um, we've got like our own division of Ryobi as well, as opposed to having to buy American tools. Um, And then I bought into that. And then the tools are so much cheaper when you don't have to buy a battery as well. That's true. Like I could go buy an orbital sander for 50 bucks. Yeah. But it doesn't come with a battery. If I bought it with a battery, it's going to cost me like 150 bucks. Yeah. So if I buy to buy a new brand, it's going to cost 150 bucks. And then I have to have another charger and and all this. Yeah, it makes sense. I can't just take the battery off my drill and put it onto my sander and, and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. Right. So I guess that's one aspect is the battery thing of, of brand loyalty, but there's the other aspect of the, like getting into an argument with your friend over is the Walter Milwaukee better. And I think that's like the, to me, the really funny part about brand loyalty is like, who who cares? But I've had arguments with my friend over why Milwaukee is better than DeWalt because I like the color red better than the color yellow. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I I have never bought a tool because of brand. Like I I've never I, I mean like I've bought Roby because I have Roby. That that's not what I mean. What I mean is like I've never done the research and gone. Oh, this battery has a different. This battery is better than than this brand's battery and this tool is better than this tool. Like the, to me, all tools are the same. All batteries are the same. Of course, you're going to get better quality, say, you know, Fez tool, but like, I'm not going to go pay $2,000 for a sander. Um, yeah. You know, you know, so, yeah. <laughs> I, I think one of the reasons it, it's like kind of a, it's a good conversation topic. People to argue about what brand is better is like, let's say cars and tools. Those are two things 
that if you're building stuff, let's say, like you're using them a lot, you're using them very intimately and you kind of get used to their tendencies. But people also say that in both of those things that like the technology has reached a point where across brands, they're largely the same. So it's like when people are arguing about wines, you're arguing about like very small variations. So there's a lot of like, there's a lot of um, subjective conversations to be had. So it's like, it's kind of like a recipe just for like a, a debate where you can never win. You can just right. endlessly debate it. Um, well, yeah. So I, I, it, I, yeah, I agree. They're so close in, in numbers that they're like trying to go like mine has 200 torques and yours only has 198. And, and the like, other thing, two, two numbers is nothing. Like, yeah. And the other thing is, is since like the, the let's say the spec, even though the specs are the same, the way they like implement those different motors and something is different. Like the, the drills are going to feel yeah. different because they don't necessarily have the same tooling to cast all the parts. So yeah. they are going to mm-hmm. have like different personalities, even if the guts are the same. Right. And where- each brand has different grips and stuff. So everything's going to yeah. have a different feel. Everyone's going to have the different taste. And then also um, with, with us, of how we use our tools, we're not putting them to our, to their paces. Like, you, you know, in a home workshop, you're going to use a drill a little bit throughout the day. We're not tradies out on a work site that's literally going to be using that drill for seven hours straight. So it's mm-hmm. funny, working at the, this install the past week, this was when I was thinking like, oh, it would be nice to have that super compact DeWalt driver. Because the, the Ryobi yeah. driver is works. It's great, but it's really bulky. And when I'm yeah, really heavy. I, when I'm elbow deep in insulation, trying to screw two flats together, mm. and holding my driver upside down in my left hand, it's no longer <laughs> like it's it's budgetness becomes apparent. And then using my buddies, to, and also the Ryobi doesn't have a light in the front, which kind of stinks. What? Um, what? Using using my or mine doesn't at least using my buddies oh, um, using my buddies Dewalt nice Dewalt driver. It's like it's tiny. Uh, it's stronger. It has the light. Um, right. So, so I guess yeah. when I think about tools, I, I don't even like what one, I've never bought a Ryobi tool cause I don't like their color, but I, uh, <laughs> I've never really thought about them as being like a competitor, uh, with those other ones. I think they're like on par with like job mate. So the Canadians will get that. That's like the, so in Canadian tire, there's like mastercraft maximum is their top then there's mastercraft which is like their general then be below that there's actually a thing called like certified and then below that there's job mate and job mate are like garbage tools i got a rotary tool but it works great but it's five dollars it's like i will (laughs) i'll probably be the only like i again like I've, i've just kind of started in this industry like in the scenery building i'm probably the only one you'll see in a job site using a ryobi driver like all these guys mm. have DeWalt or Milwaukee or Makita um, because you're right. Ryobi is not used amongst tradespeople to put it through its paces. And it's like, mm. I'm not going to be in trades over here, but I am going, I'm not going to just toss it out and buy a DeWalt. Like I would yeah. rather use that Ryobi to death and then reevaluate and say, okay, well, did I get enough life out of that? Is it worth it to me to get another one or should I switch at this point? Right. But, uh, but you're it works. It works. Go... <clears throat> Sorry, go on. Yeah, you're not going to go from Ryobi to Festool, right? Like, yeah. or some yeah. other, I don't know if Festool even makes battery powered stuff, but you know, like, you're like, it doesn't make sense for what you're doing to go to that level. Yeah. Like, yeah. In, in saying that, though, like, you, you know, maybe Ryobi is lower on the, on the totem pole when it comes to brands, but, um, if I was to buy, if I didn't buy Ryobi, right, I wouldn't own every tool that I can because, like, they're all so much more expensive. Mm-hmm. That, that's why I can own the tools I do is because they're quite cheap and I want a competition, but let's not talk about that. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and yeah, so, like, <clears throat> I can own the tools I can because they're cheaper, but I also don't see the justification of spending an extra $100 on a, on a drill. Yeah. You know, like... I, I don't use it enough for to warrant the extra expense for one, but for two, I, I think Ryobi is up there with the quality. No, I agree. I think I, I'm not, uh, I'm not hating on it by any means, but it's just, there's a reason that these guys in the job sites have the DeWalt and Milwaukee tools is yeah. because they're more compact. Um, yes. Definitely. I mean, even, I don't even, maybe they are more durable. Maybe they are stronger. 
but just for the reason that they're smaller is um mm. on a job site is very useful i think ryobi is definitely one of those brands that's more catered to the home hobbyist and yeah what, definitely sides. although they had they did just come yeah, out with point. a line of smaller compact tools so i'd be interested to compare that with like the compact dewalt driver and see if it's similar yeah yeah well i think basically what it boils down and i was totally kicking on ryobi because i knew you had so many of them but uh <laughs> I, I, like I honestly don't care. I just, I I don't um, get the, like I kind of wish I could understand people's mentalities when they're they like, like people on. I've heard people that go, I'm not going to follow that person because they only use Festool, right? That's like, yeah. so you you're gonna like hate on this person because they have, well yeah, I'm like just because they they bought a tool that you can't afford. Like it just seems like a, but they're like hate people that use Festool or woodpeckers and stuff. And I'm like, I, if they I can, just, if they can afford just, that, yeah. then let them go for it. Yeah. It's yeah. also just, I mean, I'm not going to speak for other people, but like, why even focus on that? Like, who cares? Like, aren't you, don't you care more about what like, the person is making? And I could make that too. If my drill was made from Festool. <laughs> That's <laughs> tulonium. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah. honestly, it's one of those things that I just look at and go, "There's no way that it would change." Like if I had a Ryobi drill, or even like I had a like I don't know what's even the cheapest brand out there, like Black and Decker, like a Black and Decker drill versus a, a Festool drill, it, it wouldn't matter. It, yeah. It's me who changes the whether or not that project gets done, right? Like. Mm. The, the only way I would buy, like, say, a first tool is I would love to get a domino. But, like, right. what, like, you know, for the for the price of a sander from first tool, I could buy 10 sanders from Ryobi. Right. Right. And and the question then like, is, like, what is that what is even the advantage of a first tool sander over a Ryobi sander? Yeah. D- dust collection and speed. It, mm. So I've used one once. The amount of material it took off was insane. Hmm. in In a very short period of time, they have like this. It's better than random orbit. It's like they call it Rotax or something. Anyways, whatever yeah, but- it does, it does something different, and it takes off stuff way faster. And the the like dust collection on it was like a hundred percent. Wow. Yeah, the, from what I've seen in videos, but it's really hard to capture that sort of motion on a camera. But from what I've seen in videos, it looks like Festool's sander actually spins and not just like vibrates while it spins, if that makes sense. Yeah. So like it's more it's more like a grinder with a sanding p- uh, pad mm. and not, you know, that's probably why it takes off. It takes the material off quicker. Right. But then even you see, uh, um, I was watching the other day, Mark Spagnola, he's got the first tool sander, but then he goes to a DeWalt handheld sander because the first tool obviously takes off too much material. So then he's got to go to another brand because the first tool is too much. Yeah. yeah well, so- there's also like, yeah, there's a lot of things like, and I think it's when you look at it, you kind of go like, does it, do you need to be loyal to a brand or not? Like, the I think they want you to be loyal to one. That's what, right. that's what they're trying to do. Right. It's in their best interest for you to be loyal. Yeah, Ryobi should love me and that's, I have so much Ryobi. I always I always am like on the lookout for like how much my behavior is being influenced by marketing. So that's I think one of the reasons I try to like I'm like, oh, I can just get multiple brands because I'm trying to be like, oh, that's what they want me to do. I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> You're a rebel. A rebel, yeah. Without a cause. Uh, but then you take someone like um like Jimmy and Jay Bates and they did, literally just spray painted their tools because they I kinda want to do that with my uh with my with my tools actually. But don't I like the color of my tools. Right. Don't spray paint them white. And the whole reason why I don't like DeWalt <laughs> is because I work on cars as well. And the DeWalt tools just turn black immediately. Um, and so they always look like garbage. Like the moment we touch them, because our hands are always covered in oil. The moment we touch them, they're, they're, they look like garbage. So mm-hmm. that's why I don't like the yellow tool. But my friend, I remember when I first got my first couple of Ryobi tools, and I'm like, every time I'm finished, I'm gonna get baby wipes and clean them down so they all look brand new. <laughs> I'm like, that lasted like a week, if that. It's like stuff this. Yeah. Yeah. 
The other, just one last, maybe not last thing, but one thing I was also thinking about um, brand loyalty in general is a lot of times brand loyalty comes up with products that are like pretty complicated and you don't fully understand their inner working. So I think brand loyalty works as a way for the, like the marketers want you to have trust in the companies because you don't fully understand how those products work. Like in a car, you don't really, there's no, unless you're like the genius mechanic, you don't know exactly why a Dodge may be better or worse than a Ford truck. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think brand loyalty is used as a tool um, for you to like, do you know kind of what I'm saying? Like you have to trust the companies because you don't fully understand how the things are working. And so people kind of use it as a defense mechanism. And Um, I think that that can go down to even less complex things like ketchup. What's your favorite ketchup? Which, which brand are you loyal to? And 90% of people it's, it's Heinz. Mm -hmm. Right. I didn't know Uh, there was other brands. Right. So a big controversy happened here in Canada because Heinz shut down their uh, Ontario plant um, and French's bought that farm and plant. And basically everyone switched from Heinz to French. It happened like, uh, I don't know, two years ago, but it was like in the, you know, national news that this happened. It was pretty crazy to think about, but it was how quickly people like Heinz has been the catch up for such a long mm-hmm. time. Um, and I think it's because people don't understand how ketchup is made, right? Like they don't, there's some sort of secret ingredient that you can put all this stuff together and, and it tastes better it's than the maggots. other versions. Uh, it's maggots. Oh, I thought it was sugar. Uh, no, it's maggots. Okay. Uh, <laughs> anyways, tomato is full of maggots. Yeah. Just, you know, in case you're wondering, Tomato sauce is made out of maggots and tomatoes. <laughs> I'm okay. not joking. Extra protein. Maybe in, maybe in Australia. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but, so it's that kind of thing that you kind of look at like how 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 quickly that broke people's brand loyalty. Mm, it yeah. was to me like, a, a, like an awakening moment on – I still buy Heinz, but that's – I don't know why. Yeah, it's, just- well, it's interesting how much people buy, not just based on like the performance of the product itself, but this whole aura and personality that is built up behind the product as well. Right. But it's- with something like that, did people swap because of brand loyalty or did they swap because they wanted to keep manufacturing in Canada? So there was a little bit of that, like keeping the, the farm going or whatever, but there was also yeah. like, people said that they could taste the difference because of the tomatoes. So mm. it's kind of like how if you buy, if you drink Coke in Canada versus Coke in Mexico, they taste different. Mm. Oh, okay. Because yeah. And like Kit Kats in Canada tastes very different from Kit Kats in the U S because Canada uses the good, like real Nestle Cadbury chocolate. Whereas the U S it's like mm. fake chocolate. Oh, wow. Yeah, hmm. and it's kind of like how Reese's is three cups in Canada and only Ugh. two cups in the states. That's not what you would expect. Yeah. It's the opposite. Wow. Yeah, oh, I had a Reese's once. It was gross. Well, oh, I love Reese's. You're broken. Mm. I, we can't be friends anymore. <laughs> I've, you don't like the brand. I've grown up on that sweet, sweet Nestle chocolate. But Reese's is chocolate and peanut butter combined. It's the best thing in the world. Ew. Ooh, I actually realized I have to change my clamp mandation because I thought of something that is way more topical to what we are, the topic for today. <laughs> well, I think that's a good segue. Okay. Should I go first then? Because I just thought of it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Best segue ever. <laughs> so, okay. I actually already recommended this on Into the Spotlight, but it is almost exactly in line with what we're talking about. So, um... 99% Invisible is a podcast a lot of people know. Uh, it's about design and design that you may not notice in everyday life. And like, hmm, why do why does a specific knob look this way? Or like, why is this architectural thing exist? It's like the idea is that 99% of things that you see are like invisible to perception. So they came out with a mini series a couple years ago called Articles of Interest. And it was hosted by Avery Truffleman who does a couple other podcasts as well. She's a very good host. And it's all about um, the things we wear and 
the stories behind them. So there's one about engagement rings. There's one about jeans. There's one about um, plaid. Um, there is one about pockets and like why women's clothing doesn't really have pockets, but men's clothing does. So um, the reason I thought about it with this episode is because some of them talk about how certain things are just completely a product of marketing, like engagements for engagement rings, for example, engagement rings um, were essentially a, a product of the De Beers diamonds company when they were looking for a way to market diamonds to middle-class people in the early 20th century. And they, the, and the diamonds are forever marketing campaign. Yeah. Right. And now look at it now. It's like, it's almost expected. It's so entrenched in us and, you could trace it back to this marketing campaign in like the 1910s. So if you want, I think I was just thinking as towards the end of this conversation, I was like, wow, this is getting into deep marketing psychology territory. So if you want more of that, I would definitely recommend that podcast series. Um, It's if you go on the 99% invisible podcast page, it'll be within that because it's a, it's a mini series, but it's, it's really interesting. I think I've listened to all of them in there. They're all really interesting. It made me think about clothes in a way that I never had before. It, it reminds me a lot of like Malcolm Gladwell. One of his books mm-hmm. talks a lot about like things like that. Maybe I, I think, I don't know where I heard about the diamonds or thing, but it sounds very uh, familiar to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's really interesting. I think you're getting the wrong idea of De Beers. Dub <laughs> Grant is. is. Yeah. Huh. Um, well, then I guess it's me. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Viva La Dirt League. They're a New Zealand uh, comedy yes. uh, thing. And they're uh, they're pretty funny. Uh, I've recently gone through their entire epic NPC, man, which is uh, like an NPC is a, non- yeah, it's a non-player character in a... Uh, usually in a, in a role-playing game, but uh, it's basically like this, this like, you know, world of Warcraft or, or Skyrim or something like that. And uh, it's kind of set in that kind of fantasy old world kind of thing. Anyways, really funny. There are little, mm. like two, two to four minute skits. Um, and it's just like, if you've ever played uh, like a world of Warcraft type game, then you'll probably find it funny Mm -hmm. and they also have like so that one's like uh you know those rpg games but they also have one for uh first person shooters and they have uh, a whole like series on PUBG, um Mm. and it's just kind of funny kind of really just scrolling through their channel kind of reminds me of like whitest kids you know do you ever watch oh yeah that was a long time ago yeah the Call of Duty skit where like his audio is going through. Mom, yeah. guys, yeah. <laughs> man, why does kids? So you they know? more talk. So so mo- most of their skits are like on like the bugs and stuff that are in co- common in games, mm. um, and that like the the sort of the the meme sort of stuff that comes out of games. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, oh, this they're so good at what they do. Have you? If you, I don't know if you've seen their behind the scenes stuff, but like. They're a full production company, um, Viva La Dirt League. So they, they that place like where they do epic, epic NPC man. They hire that place out, yeah, for a week, and they literally record like months and months worth of videos, and they use all red cameras, everything. Like it's a full production. Yeah, Sick. they got catering company, everything. It's it's. It, it's crazy. It's as if a TV show did skits for YouTube. It's it's so good. That's yeah. what it really looks like. It's it is to yeah. the quality that it looks. It's a TV Very show. Professional. Yeah, yeah. And they're um the uh oh board. I think they called it call it. But it's like they so they have a um like a like GameStop sort of shop, mm-hmm. and they do skits there as like employees and stuff. And yeah, good good. Good, uh, good shout. So mine this week is um, not that he needs a shout out, but Jimmy Duresta's can cozy video. I've never heard and, of this um, person. Who is this? <laughs> I chose this video for one reason and one reason only, and that is the music he used. Oh really? <laughs> and 
it is like the best music I've ever heard in a woodworking video. And it has it's not relatable at all to the to the video. It's just really funny. Like it, it's it just <laughs> I, shows not, Jimmy's I sense of humor. But I was not, that's not what I was expecting the reason to be. Hmm. Well, he never puts music. Like, literally, so it's kind of funny. Put it put it on at like the first five seconds. You I'm listening now. <laughs> it's a bop. It's, yeah, such good. It's kind it's kind of like swing. Um, I mean the person the, the um, music. The project's pretty cool too. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, um, moving on, we thank our F Clamp level Patreon, which is Leroy Big Rock Timberworks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so speak. Viva La Dirt League has a Leroy Jenkins skit. Yes. And it's Ooh, basically yeah. the guy tries to um, say Leroy Jenkins and they, and like one of the other characters goes up and like which is like sh- makes him go shh that it's it's old news it's 10 years old now stop <laughs> it's not funny it's not original okay I'll sure. stop making the joke then <laughs> yeah, I want to make the joke too but I, he's right it's not it's not good it's not. So so speaking of that 2 days ago I downloaded well Oh no don't do that Yeah Oh, it's too late now. I'm hooked. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't played it for like 20 years, so it's going to be a big um, difference. So I played it for six months when it first came out, mm. and that was it. And that's the last yeah. I played it. So however long. Whenever it came out, I played it within the first six months, and that was it. Yeah. But I kind of miss it. But it also, like <laughs> the latest uh, uh, Epic NPC man, they talk about when like role-playing games become a job. And that's kind of how it's starting to feel. Like it literally feels like you know you're you're in a job, not in like a game anymore. It's weird. Yeah. yeah, it's it's like when um, like you know when we were kids, we'd play like Age of Empires and and that sort of you know like you'd play Age of Empires, you just, you just play the game. But like these days, it's like start building this building and then come back in a day, and it'll be finished. And I hate timed games. I can't stand it. I just want to mm. play the game. I don't want to come back in half an hour and feed my crops and <laughs> all that crap. I do that in real life. I don't need that in a video game. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, anyway, we kind of just brushed past. But, yeah, Leroy from Big Rock Timberworks, thank you for your support on Patreon. Um, if you do want to support us, we um, do have a Patreon where you also get – yeah. Um, you also get access to the pre and after show, either one or both, depending on what we record for that week. But you get access to everything. Um, and we also sometimes do posts of hidden photos and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, you can $1 episode get access to everything. Yeah. But if you don't want to become a Patreon, um, even just sharing the show or leaving a a rating or um, a review. We need reviews because Molly hasn't done a voice for quite a while. I'll just start doing the next Sorry. episode in a different voice. The whole episode. <laughs> oh, I'd love to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I'd love. Yeah. I'll I, do think, Dobby, I think that Dobby we should the whole episode. We should do the, um, the after show should be Molly in another voice. <laughs> Ooh, there we go. Yeah. Little Patreon exclusive. <laughs> I eat. Hmm. Uh, where else are we? Yeah, so we don't have any reviews this week, unfortunately. And also, thank you to TF Turning for the music before and after each episode. Thank you. We'll have links to his socials in the show notes as well. Yeah. Um, anything else before we move on? I did. I did have something I want to quickly say. Um, I forgot to say it before. Um, but with the whole like V8 supercar thing, the point I was trying to get to with the brand loyalty is that, so growing up, it was Ford or Holden. Literally every car had the same everything. All The only thing that changed was the shell on the outside and the driver had the same motor, same everything. <clears throat> so it is closer to NASCAR. So, so brand, brand isn't as... Um, isn't as important as people think because most of them are bought have made out of the same bin. Yeah. Yeah. So the moral of the most, story is it's not about the brand, it's about the person using the tool. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. 
So for all you people who'd be like, if I had a CNC, I could do that. It's all about you. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. All right. Wow. So I, just can, a, um, I just had a wild, deep thought, but I will save it for the after show. I need to write right. this down. <laughs> all right. Where can everyone find you, Molly? Uh, you can find me at Morley Kurt everywhere. Great. Well, you can find me at the Grant Alexander everywhere. And Adam. Sorry, I'm. Well, Molly just wrote in our <laughs> in our thing. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Okay, yeah, that's what I want to talk about in the after show because I think this. Is oh, a, okay, yeah, all right. Just so I remember, right. um, you can find me at Makey Mackey everywhere as well. Makeymackey dot com. Actually, I can I see why so you would think that that's like me talking to you. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's just a note for myself. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm literally looking at the curtains behind you, wondering what's going on. <laughs> you think I'm like in a haunted house or something. Uh, yeah. All right, everyone. Bye. 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 Apologies for the noise. I think my next door neighbor is mowing their lawn. <laughs> oh my Actually, God. hold up. Keep t- I'm going I'm to close the windows. Keep talking. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think I might actually try and find like an actual foam and not EVA foam. Yeah. Oh my God. That wow. is the loudest thing in the world. <laughs> As we watch Worley run around closing windows. That is the. I would be so mad if I had that lawnmower as my like next door neighbor. That is an insanely loud lawnmower, and it's eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah, that is the what? loudest Who lawnmower in the world. Eight a.m. Well, it's actually there. It's a ride-on mower, and they're right outside the window. It's actually hour long that's being mowed, but it's small, so hopefully it only lasts like a couple minutes. Wow, At eight a.m. though. 8:30 yeah, my neighbor now. does sure. that too. <laughs> Yeah, there's still 8.30 a.m. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on, a, on a weekday. Yeah, most people think on a weekday it's okay to, to start earlier. I don't understand. Yeah. They're like, 9 o'clock on Saturday and Sunday, but on the weekdays, 8 o'clock is when I can go out there and weed whack. And I'm like, no, no, you can't. I'm still asleep. They just assume everyone's at work already. Yeah. Yeah. Too bad it's COVID and that's not a thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the states, it is. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. So, so we do actually have a topic this week. Um, we're going to talk about brand loyalty. Oh which, man, we um, could have totally had a segue with talking about what brand of lawnmower that was. <laughs> but it's like, oh, is it a Toro or a John Deere? It it's it, there's some orange on it. I, don't, I have no idea. Huh? You're supposed to just make we, something up, Morley. Okay, it was, it was John Deere. <laughs> oh, oh, my I God. It was finished. That, that is the loudest. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> we have um, we have ride on lawnmowers here Uh-oh, that are made by Ryobi, and they literally take, like, four of the big batteries. Really? Yeah. I'm guessing if it was orange, it was a Kubato. Kubato, yeah. Kubata. Kubata. I don't think that's how it's pronounced. I think it's Kubota. (laughs) Kubota. There we go. Hey. Kubota. I've never heard anyone say it before. I just have seen them. But yeah. (laughs) Are are, are we... uh are we still recording, so, or is, are we are we editing this part out while the lawnmower passes? I didn't know what. No, we're still on. recording. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if when I went to close the windows, you guys said something. No. no. Well, maybe we should edit it out. It's pretty loud. I can't even imagine you being able to concentrate with that. Yeah, it is a little loud. Hmm. Do you want? Do you want me to? Do you, do you? Should we just splice this part out? Yeah. Okay. Let me. I'll, let me look out the window real quick. I'll see what their progress is. Okay.